From the time he was a boy, he knew he wanted to make films. He lost his mother at the age of 11, but he first saw his father cry when they went to see a movie together, showing him the power of telling stories on film. Ken Burns studied at Hampshire College. There, he made his first documentary about historic Sturbridge Village, but it was his hour-long film on the Brooklyn Bridge that brought Burns to PBS, and a partnership that has continued for over 30 films, exploring much of U.S. history, from the Civil War to the Roosevelts. Now Burns brings us his latest work, Country Music, airing over 16 hours in eight episodes, telling the stories of the men and women who created the genre half of Americans listen to, and ultimately, the story of America itself, the love and the loss, the human experience, the differences and the similarities we share. On Bloomberg Big Decisions, Ken Burns. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. Great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you, David. Let me start at the beginning in a sense of why history? You know, I had a, a crisis when I was 40 years old and my late father-in-law who was an eminent psychologist, um, and I were talking. And he said, uh, look what you do for a living. Uh, you wake the dead. You make Abraham Lincoln and Jackie Robinson come alive. Who do you think you really want to wake up? And what he was referring to is that my mother had died when I was 11 after a nearly 10-year illness, mm -hmm. cancer. And uh, I spent an entire dislocated childhood coping with the illness and her eminent death and then her death and the aftermath. And I think that in some ways he was right. Uh, I'm into history because it's about trying to make those who are gone come alive again to what I've called an emotional archaeology. Does it work? I mean, do you, through your work, feel you have some connection still with your mother or is that taking it too far? My mother died on April 28, 1965, and um, my dad, who had a uh, fairly strict curfew for my younger brother and me, forgave that curfew if there was a movie on TV or something to go see at the Cinema Guild or the campus theater near our house, even at 11 o'clock on a school night or a movie going till 1 a.m. on a school night on TV. And I watched my dad for the very first time cry. He hadn't cried when my mom was sick or when she died or at the funeral. And when he cried at a movie, I went, I get it. That's what I want to be. I was I just turned 12. I ended up going to Hampshire College, and all of the teachers there were social documentary still photographers and filmmakers that reminded me, I think correctly, that there is as much drama in what is and what was as anything the human imagination comes up with. And I do think it works. I do think there is something that happens in the combination of the images and the words and the music of our films, whether it is that first one on the Brooklyn Bridge that I did, or the Civil War, or baseball, or recently Vietnam and now country music, in which that emotional archaeology at moments is present. And you feel uh, a sense of what I feel. I've spent my life studying us, both the lowercase two-letter plural pronoun and also its capitalized version, the U.S. And what I've come to understand is that there's only us, there's no them. As much as our binary dialectical society wants to say there's an us and a them, there's not. At the same time, you and I grew up about the same time in Ann Arbor, yes. going to the same high school. And we were living in a time that was very much us and them. Yes. Uh, we saw it in Watts. We saw it in Detroit, not far from Ann Arbor, exactly. uh, as they burned the city down. And we also saw it in Vietnam. It was us versus them, yep. the people who were for the war and against it. Did that form part of who you are oh, today? Most definitely, most definitely. And I think it's taken me a long time not to shed, because I am a political person. I am a person in the world. I am a person who digests media. I can't help but set up these oppositional stuff of red state, blue state, young, old, black, white, gay, straight, rich, poor, north, south, east, whatever you, we do to make sure that we know that there's something I'm distinct from you. You went to Hampshire College. I did. An excellent school, but it's different. It's, it's different. different. It's the easiest thing I can tell you, David, is it's graduate school and an undergraduate level. So if you need, when you go to college, and most people do, to have their hands held and take the 101 this and the 101 that, it's not for you. But if, you, if you've got a fire in your belly, if you know what you're after, if you know what you want to do, and that includes doctors and lawyers as well as Indian chiefs and, and other things, um, documentary filmmakers, 
it's the best place. Were you making films when you were at Hampshire? I was. I was trying to. I had unbelievable teachers, uh, still photographers, Jerome Liebling and Elaine Mays, who also made films. When did you decide it's documentaries you want to do rather than fiction? I think it's when I arrived at Hampshire and saw that they were saying that there was uh, as much drama in what is this moment or what has gone before, the past, history, what I, what I work in, anything the human imagination makes up. But let me just say that what you're asking about is really, as, in essence, a question about story. So the laws of storytelling apply to a documentary filmmaker just as they apply to Steven Spielberg. Steven can make stuff up, and I've talked to him on stage about this. He can make stuff up, but we're doing the same things. And, you know, originally uh, documentaries were more... Um, didactic, they were educational, uh, expository, but as soon as we got into telling stories with documentary, it's the same laws apply, except I can only have the Battle of Gettysburg take place on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863, and it all goes back to, you know, Aristotle's essay on poetics. I mean, we're all talking about that, whether it's a stage play, whether it's a book, whether it's a short story, whether it's a movie, whatever it might be. I, I don't know anything more dramatic than, than this country music or the Vietnam series. When you make a documentary, what is your goal? Are you going for the story that reflects a larger truth, or are you trying to get it just as accurate as you can? That's a smart, smart question. I'm trying to get it as accurate as I can, but I know that I'm constantly butting up the facts of things, and sometimes the requirements of story cause yielding. I mean, filmmakers are notorious. This scene is working, let's not touch it. But I have a neon sign in my office that says in script, it's complicated. Meaning, have the guts to open up that thing that's working and realize we may destabilize it. It may not work as well as it did before, but we're going to be more accurate. And sometimes, as Winton once said to me in our jazz series, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. You've got to be able to contain contradictory facts. And people are hugely contradictory. You know, the preacher who is preaching against the evils of sex and sin and homosexuality who's having an affair with young boys. I mean, that's a classic and egregious example, but most of us have both things in us. When was the first time you had a film that you said, okay, that's it, it's a documentary? Was it the Brooklyn Bridge film? I think, for all intents and purposes, the first film is the one that was first broadcast on public television on the Brooklyn Bridge, which I spent forever trying to make and, you know, figure out how you edit, how you tell stories with photographs. My dad had been an anthropologist and an amateur still photographer. I'd been trained less by filmmakers than by still photographers. So for me still, the DNA of any film is a still photograph and what you can do with it. And so I don't just even look at the photograph, I also listen to it. Is that back bat crack cracking? Is the, is the crowd cheering? Are the troops tramping? Are the cannons firing? So. Waking the Dead is also in relationship to taking what is essentially kinesthetically static, a still photograph, and giving it movement and emotion. So that those two things, I found that if you tilt up from what uh, somebody's waistband and there are two pistols stuck in it, Civil War photograph, right? You t and you tilt up and it's this kid that can't be more than 14 years mm -hmm. old. Haven't you told a story? Or what if you reverse that and you start at this innocent kid mm -hmm. and you tilt down and in his waistband are two revolvers, no, no holsters, just stuck in there. There's a drama and a tension that you've created just by moving. In the second or third shot of the Civil War series, there's a pan along a person lying down until you realize it's a dead Confederate in Devil's Den in the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. And um, it, it just has a poignancy and a kind of effect that you wouldn't get if you just held that photograph at arm length and you try to make it come alive. And so I've always been trying to will those still photographs or whatever we have to work with. Now, how do you choose your projects? Do you have to love them or enjoy them? The glib answer is I don't choose the topics, they choose me. How big is your operation? So in New Hampshire, where I live and work, 
at the most, we have might maybe have 25, 30 people. Mm -hmm. In New York, we've got a handful of people. In Brooklyn, uh, where my daughter and my son-in-law represent one of my producing strands, I've got four producing strands. Uh, they've got four or five people as well. So it's, it's a very tiny shop. If you don't like it, it's all our fault, my fault. Each project is a zero-sum game. If it's $15 million, I raise the 15 from a variety of corporate sources. Bank of America has been our corporate underwriter for 13 years and just signed out for another 10. It's foundations like the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and the Pew Charitable Trust. It's um, PBS itself or the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, sometimes the National Endowment for the Humanities, and individuals of wealth and small private family foundations. All of us deal with budgets, no matter what we do. How do you know that you said $15 million, yeah. just for example? We how don't do you know. know. That, because how many years did you work on country music? So country music is eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. It There's has no project you start. 30 million budget. So here's what happens. It grows. And I go out and raise more, which is, mm -hmm. a, is a good thing. I'm not going to someone and said, I need more money. I just go, we need more money. I got to get back out on the road. And I have a nonprofit that was created by friends called the Better Angel Society that raises money from individuals of wealth and small private family foundations. And they've been unbelievable for us. But let me tell you, there's basically no business model for what I do. Like, I could go and end all my fundraising problems tomorrow by going to a, a premium channel or a streaming service, and they'd pay me the $30 million it took to do country music or, or the Vietnam War, but they'd want it in two and a half years. They wouldn't say, Vietnam, sure, take 10 and a half years, which is what I needed, or eight and a half for country music. Their model doesn't work in that way, and mine does. We never stop researching. We never stop writing. All leaders have to think about story and narrative. No matter yeah. what you're reading, That's right. you have to have a story for the organization. Uh, there's a balance between taking in information, being open-minded, yes. and saying, I want to hear it at all points of view. How do you strike that balance? How do you keep your mind open, but at the same time, just not have a point of view, not have something to say? I, I, th that is a, as, as smart a question that's ever been asked me. Um, I'm not sure quite how to answer it. It's so in-depth and it's complicated. One of the things we've learned is to trust that process that I described. It's sometimes tough to stand there and not know and permit that not knowing to obtain for a while until you can figure out a way to tell it. It's tough to say it's complicated and take that perfect scene and undo it and add something that does in fact diminish it from that perfection but makes it better and it fits in with its brothers and sister scenes in that episode. Um, you work with good people. That's the first thing which I'm sure you would understand. People who understand and trust that process as well. At the end of the day, my job has to be to decide that very moment. And I think the, the essence of leadership is that. It is not so much the exertion of power as it is the timely exertion of it. And then we move up the kind of hierarchical ladder through the associate producers and the archivists and the, and the uh, assistant editors and, and, and up to the producers and, and myself uh, to figure out what we're going to do. But it's valuable to listen. And sometimes, the art of leadership is not making a decision. It's permitting other people to own that decision or to not to postpone the decision. And then, of course, there's that time when you absolutely have to say, no, we're doing it this way. What part of no don't you understand? <laughs> uh, how do you choose your projects? And more specific than that, do you have to love them or enjoy them or be invested in at least some part of them? Do you have to be invested and say, I'm going to spend some large portion of my life on this. I have to be invested in it. Always. And so the glib answer is, I don't choose the topics, they choose me. You know what I mean? It's just they sneak up and you realize that this is a story running on all cylinders. I mean, I, country music had been an idea, but it just existed in my head. And then a friend of mine at the end of 2010, I was in Dallas, he said to me, you ever think about country music? And it just exploded. And it was like I got down on my knees and proposed to country music. Um, I've had a couple of films where I didn't like the person, Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. for example. Um, Thomas Hart Benton, the painter, but they were so colorful and the work they did was so interesting and the stories that swirled around them. And we never felt that it was contradictory to show both the, the problems as well as the successes because you, you brought this up earlier. Um, the people closest to us, the people we love the most in the world, 
remain inscrutable in some aspect mm -hmm. to us. So how would we have the arrogance or the presumption to go back and say, I can know and tell you who Abraham Lincoln is, or Theodore Roosevelt is, or Franklin, or, or even you know Merle Haggard or something like that, even if you got Merle Haggard, helping to explain himself. There are aspects of me that my children know that I don't have a clue to, right? Yeah. And my coworkers <laughs> really know. And they're, you know, um, somebody <laughs> said about Franklin Roosevelt, he says, he's the only president that knows my boss is a son of a bitch. <laughs> you know, and I just, I love that. There was something about, he understood the dynamic of what it was enough to know that everybody thinks that their boss is a son of a bitch. When you first took a look at country music, did you understand what it would be? Watching this, there's a little bit of a sleight of hand, because yes. it's actually a history of America. If you do this deep dive, you realize, oh my God, the, the banjo's from Africa. This yeah. is a story about race. Once country music had chosen you, Ken Burns, how'd you go about it? That's a big topic. So the first thing I did is I went to my longtime uh, producing and writing partner, Dayton Duncan, and I said, country music, and it exploded, and he got down on his knees and, and proposed to it, and then he and I started talking about how it would be constructed. I started raising money. He started thinking about how you would structure, particularly the beginning and the end. Like, when do you leave it? We're in the history business. We're not gonna go up to the present and argue who's better, Kenny Chesney or Blake Shelton or whatever. We're not there. We're gonna stop in the mid-90s at the heart of Garth's popularity, the death of Bill Monroe, and then in a last chapter follow Johnny uh, Cash, mm -hmm. whose family he married into, the Carters, mm -hmm. are in our first episode to his death in 2003. That was, the end was pretty much we could agree on. But where it would begin in the 1920s and then at what point we would stop and go back and collect the centuries of African and also Celtic and British Isles history to bring you up to the present and we could resolve the first episode by launching the two great supergroups, the, the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers, uh, a superstar. Uh, all of that had to be worked on. And then the third producer with me, I'm um, also the director, is Julie Dunphy, who then is setting out people to find the photographs, to find the footage, uh, to find all the stories. When you first took a look at country music, um, did you understand what it would be in no. this sense? It's a lot of great stories, a lot of great songs, a lot of great characters over a period of time. That I knew. Fabulous. But watching this, there's a little bit of a sleight of hand because yes. it's actually a history of America, of a good part of America. You have the Dust Bowl in there, you have Depression in there, you have race relations in there. It covers an awful lot of America so, from the 20s up to the 90s. Here's what you can do. You can explain it and just tell people what it is. But if you do this deep dive, you realize, oh my God, the, the banjo's from Africa. This yeah. is a story about race, that, that most of the early greats of country music had an African-American mentor. Uh, and on race relations, Charlie Pride. And he goes out the first time to perform in public and nobody knew he was black because they didn't show any pictures. Yeah, he comes out there, please give a warm welcome for a Mississippian. He's, it's actually in Detroit. There are 18,000 people. And the, Ralph Emery, who's the MC, a, a radio announcer at WSM, the Grand Ole Opry station in Nashville, says, how many of you are first, second, third generation from the South? A lot, a lot of hands go up. Well, give a warm welcome for a Mississippian Charlie Pride. And they come out, yay, like this. And he goes out and he says, well, I must be shocked seeing me wearing this permanent tan, little titter of laughter. And then he opens his mouth. Yeah. And he's got one of the greatest voices you've ever heard. And he's been successful on the radio because no one's saying this is a black man. They're just saying this is a good voice. So there's Charlie Pride. He goes on to have two, uh, 29 number one hits. He's the only first person of any color who's a CMA Artist of the Year two years in a row. It's one of those transcendent stories that belie all the conventional wisdom. Oh, country music is just about good old boys and pickup trucks and hound dogs and six pack of beer. You know what country music is about? It's about love and loss. The human project, the human experience is, we don't get out of this alive. Loss is a huge part of what happens. And when you have Hank Williams singing, hear that lonesome whippoorwill, he sounds too blue to fly, the midnight train is whining low, I'm so lonesome. I could cry, there's not a human being that doesn't know what yeah. he's talking about. So if you want to sort of reduce country music to some just, is right. just a conservative, white, southern, rural thing, 
you've missed some of the greatest poetry and some of the greatest art there is. It's love and loss, but not necessarily the love and loss that we think about, because no. what we tend to think about is romantic love right. and loss maybe of a girlfriend, a wife, yeah. a husband, things like that. Go back to Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner, when she writes, I will always love you. I always thought that was written yeah. about romantic love yes. and a breakup. She's talking it's a about, very different situation. It's a woman's declaration of independence from a man who has kept her from realizing her full potential. When Loretta Lynn sings, don't come home with drinking with loving on your mind, nobody in rock and roll is dealing with this. Nobody in folk music is dealing with this. This is the mid 60s, the same year the National Organization for Women is founded. The same year the term women's liberation goes into the lexicon. She's doing that and then the pill. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna be a brooder hen in your, you know, your chicken house, putting out a baby every year. I'm done with this, I got the pill. You know, um, it's big scandal. Conservative stations aren't going to play it, which of course makes it an even bigger hit as a result. But she's not going to identify herself and say, I'm into women's liberation or I'm a feminist. But what she's expressing are what women through all time have been trying to say to us knuckleheads. No, you can't have it just your way. You are not listening to who I am. And it is amazing that the musical form is, it, that's doing this is not jazz, mm -hmm. it's not R&B, it's country music. That's the one that has been leading the way and from the very beginning there are strong, strong women. Adversity and even tragedy runs through this country music film. Uh, you see it again and again in all sort of guises. These are very creative people. As you say, they're poets, they're songwriters. Do those two things come together? Absolutely. Do you have to have suffered some tragedy to really be creative? Let's remember Dolly Parton is born in a dirt poor East Tennessee holler that she doesn't have running water, she doesn't have an outdoor, indoor plumbing, she doesn't have electricity, and the doctor who comes to, get, to deliver her is paid with a sack of cornmeal. And she's Dolly Parton. This is a modern singer, right? So out of the struggle, the desire to escape the specific gravity of these privations and the trauma that comes from poverty and just, just stultifying uh, lack of, of just the basic necessities of life is a friction. And sometimes it kills people and sometimes it produces a creativity that produces, in the case of the country music people, great art that transcends that situation and gives not only the artist the ticket out, but it gives everyone else at least the permission to dream their way out. How ambitious are you in this sense? Uh, we've talked about us, us versus them in the 60s, trying to bring us back into us, both lowercase and uppercase us. A lot of people in this country today are very concerned about the us. Yeah, I mean, we. It, it, this is a problem for both sides. And if you remember when the hurricanes came through, there were people, the Duck Dynasty people, were saving the lives of brown and black people in Houston and in Louisiana. You know, it's all there. We have that possibility for us to remember. It's, it's incumbent upon our politicians not to play those cards, that the them card, to saying, look, you know, what's really a true American is this. Let's pull out what's really American, because the second you've pulled it out, the machine is shutting down. It's grinding to a halt. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. We are an alloy. And when we celebrate that, it's only us and not them. And that's true, not just in the United States, but the world. And all, people understand this in a different way. Unfortunately, we live in a media culture that needs to have that oppositional thing going. And we have a political culture that realizes that that is, at least in the short term, successful. But at the end of the day, as someone who's watched all of these different periods in American history, I become entirely optimistic. We don't have to accept that. We don't have to be our worst selves, we can be, as Abraham Lincoln said, we can hear the better angels of our nature and act on them and not the lowest common denominator. And when that happens, then we're, we're undefeatable and we have, uh, uh, we have only a rising road ahead of us. Ken Burns, thank you so much. Thank you. Really great to talk with you. My pleasure. Thank you.